In this video, I had the pleasure of interviewing Ken Ji, my good friend and fellow data science YouTuber. So in the video, we talked about his career as a data scientist, how he manages his time. We also talked about his YouTube and content creation endeavors, particularly how he became a data science YouTuber, how he initiated the 66 days of data, and finally, we talked about why papayas. Because as you might have noticed, several of Ken's video, he integrated papayas into the video. And so if you would like to find out why, stick to the end of the video and you're going to find out the answer. And before proceeding to the podcast, let me provide a brief introduction about Ken G. So Ken is currently the head of data science at Scouts Consulting Group. He founded many companies as a startup. He was a data science intern at GE, a marketing analytics intern, and also a corporate marketing intern at the PGA Tour. He received the Bachelor's of Science in Economics from Towson University. He holds a Master's in Commerce, Marketing and Management, from University of Virginia, and he has a Master's of Science from the DePaul University in Computer Science. And recently he was and recently he was appointed as the adjunct professor at DePaul University. And Ken is also the ambassador to the Z by HP and NVIDIA Data Science. And so without further ado, we're starting right now. Yeah, so thank you, Ken, for being on the podcast of my channel. Um, before we begin, can perhaps we have you introduce about yourself a bit? For sure, for sure. So for those who don't know me, my name is Ken G. I'm the head of data science at a small sports analytics focused consulting firm. And I am probably better known for my YouTube channel and my podcast and the other content that I create that focuses on science, data science learning, some storytelling, some project examples, those types of things. So. Uh, if you are not familiar with my stuff, it's, it's nice to meet you. Right. I'm, I'm sure, pretty sure everyone will know about Kenji. Um, so the first question is, how did you break into data science? That is a good question. So I wouldn't say I necessarily broke in. It was just this slow progression to get into the field and to accumulate the skills. So I'd identified that there was something I wanted to learn better and that thing almost always has been sports. So it started with baseball. I wasn't really keeping my stats, but everyone cares about their batting average, right? They want to know how well they're doing, how many home runs they hit. And eventually I got into golf and I was taking that very seriously. I wanted to play professionally. And in college, I realized that I could apply economics to my golf game. And so I started, I was taking, I was an economics major. I realized that, hey, I can understand the the means, the standard deviations of my whole performance. I could look at the marginal return of my improvements on practicing one area of my game versus another. And eventually I got really into that hybrid of golf and data. And I just kept tugging on that rope and I realized that, hey, it's cool to just understand my own performance, but what if I tried to predict the performance of professional golfers and see who would win each week? So I started to try and understand model building and I just kept chasing this question. and. Eventually, I realized that, wow, I want more technical skills. I want coding skills. So I went back to, to graduate school for computer science. And at a certain point, all of these projects that I'd done relating to sports created a lot of opportunities for me. I was able to get into the current company that I'm at because I built this portfolio of analyzing golf data. I landed a couple of different internships because essentially I just told them the story about all this golf data and all the sports data that I, that I analyzed. And uh, I also, uh, one of the internships that I took was even before I went back to grad school, they didn't have an internship. I was a product that I use is called DraftKings. And I went on their website. I take it back. They had an undergrad internship and I was looking for a graduate internship and they had a marketing analytics position or they, they just had an intern. And I wrote them an email. I said, this is what I'm interested in doing. I want to do more hardcore analytics. I, I'm a grad student, you know, let's talk. I just want to learn more about these opportunities. And fortunately they liked me and they were willing to make this whole new position for me so I could work on the stuff that I wanted to do to fill in those gaps. And I think overall how I broke in is that I just chased questions. I chased opportunities. I wanted to know more about certain things. I wanted to know more about certain companies and, and, and the different type of work. And if you keep pulling on those threads and you keep learning and you keep producing, opportunities inevitably come out of that. Yeah, that's very inspiring. It's 
Uh, I find it very awesome that you could create your own goals and then you create your, you're essentially creating your own opportunities. And as you mentioned that the company really didn't have a position at that. They just call it internship, but then you pretty much did the homework. You proposed to them your idea and they love it. They love it enough that they were willing to create a, an entirely new position to accommodate your idea. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's a great example that other aspiring data scientists could, could definitely uh, follow in your footstep into breaking into an internship in data science. Yeah, that position that, that they created for me actually paid more than the other undergrad uh, internship that they had. So I was like, oh my oh. goodness, like I would have taken that pay. I just wanted to work oh, here. Oh, <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, and, and you, you briefly mentioned about you went to grad school to learn coding. Could you tell us what was your experience back then and essentially how did you learn coding? Yeah, so I it's the second time I went back to grad school. So the first time I went for a master's in, in commerce, which is like a global business type degree. And I learned some SQL and some statistics during the course of that. But I got out and I wanted to start building more models, more advanced models than just linear regression to predict golf outcomes. And I realized that Python is a thing, R is a thing. These are how people are building very complex algorithms. And I said, I want to do that. That makes sense to me. How do I go about approaching that? And at the time, I mean, this was quite some time ago, um, I didn't see a path for learning those things as clearly as they're laid out now. There weren't necessarily as many, uh, there were very few boot camps. There weren't many certificate or online class programs. And I said, I did very well in school. I knew how to do school. I knew how to structure things. I knew how to work that system and learn in that ecosystem. And going back to school for me meant that I was going to a familiar place. I also thought that I'd get a lot of resources from school. I've always been very interested in entrepreneurship. I, by going back to school, was getting access to entrepreneurial resources. I was getting access to teachers, to other students, to help I wanted to start another business. And for me, it, again, it just it just made sense. I, I was able to go back. I, I obviously did my homework before going in. I was working in management consulting before that. And I was learning a little bit on Code Academy before I went and took the formal classes. And that made the intro programming class pretty digestible for me. But there were a lot of people in that class who just went in and that was the first time they ever saw any programming languages. And to me, I don't think that's a way that you get ahead in this field. You have to be preparing and you have to be applying and it's this iterative loop. And so that's something I think carried me really far in, in my own learning is that I was constantly either trying to be a little bit ahead of my class or I was taking what I was doing in my class and applying it elsewhere. So fortunately, I was working full time at the time and I was taking what I was learning in class and applying it to my work at the time. And so the positive feedback loop is something that always had me iterating and learning hands on on the material that I was picking up. And so fortunately for me, the portfolio that I built, the work that I'd done, the story that I could tell from this trying to get ahead and learning meant that it was a lot easier for me to land an internship or a job position outside of the classroom because I had all this other work that I was doing and, and it was this really positive cycle. So I would recommend thinking about, okay, I'm not just here to learn this. I have to figure out how to use this. And if I can tell a good story about how to use something, I'm going to be desirable to companies for employment. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I like it how you're taking what you have learned to the next level. So you're, you're applying it. So essentially, it's like I hear somewhere that you either use it or you lose it. And so you're, you're providing a very good example of how you're actually applying what you have learned on your existing work jobs that you're working on. And yeah, that, that's an awesome way. Um, could you maybe shed light on this iterative process um, from your answer? I could tell that you're constantly creating performance indicator for yourself. You're constantly creating goals for yourself and you're adapting that goal and then you're, you're, you're meeting that goal one by one and then you're creating new goals um, to pretty much drive you forward. Could you maybe explain about that process that you have? Yeah, you know, I've always been fairly goal oriented. So growing up, it was athletic goals. I wanted to do X, Y, Z. And usually I set way too outlandish goals. But a nice thing about 
the technical field is it's it's a lot easier to set more systematic and realistic goals. Usually the goals are around time or or outcomes or or outputs. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just always tried to break down the bigger problems into things that were digestible and that I could apply my work to. So if I wanted to build a model for predicting golf, for example, I could break things down by the data science life cycle. So I could say, okay, the first part of this is I want to collect the data. And then I'd look at that that data collection and say, okay, even within that, I have to figure out where I'm going to get this data from. That's a, a milestone. That's a goal. And then I have to figure out, okay, uh, what tools should I use to collect this data? Maybe I'm using Selenium. Maybe I'm using, using Beautiful Soup. Maybe it's an API endpoint. Maybe it's something else altogether that I have to pull together. And so just breaking down all of the big picture things that I was working on was really valuable. And then I'm saying, okay, maybe I'm learning about web scraping in a class. I can apply that to this part of the cycle. And if you're constantly thinking about how you're going to use the things you're learning and the scenarios that it'll be useful to you, it's just going to stick with you so much more. I was so obsessed with predicting outcomes in golf. I tried to apply every single thing that I learned in from coding or from the machine learning classes, or even from the Monte Carlo simulation courses that I took to that outcome. And that just made it stick to me so much more. Wow. Yeah. That's very inspirational. Yeah. So perhaps this would naturally lead us to the next question, which is data science is a very rapidly growing field and the field is so vast. How do you handle all of this chaotic um, tech stack in data science? And also how do you deal with imposter syndrome? Yeah. So I think the, the best way to put it is that I forget what the quote is, but it, you know, a, a million mile journey starts with a single step, right? And putting one foot in front of the other is the best way to, to gain momentum and get going before you know it, you've walked a thousand steps or a million steps or whatever it might be. And I think the learning is very similar. You just have to take action somewhere. You know, if you start unraveling uh, a rug or something with one thread, eventually you just pull the whole thing apart, right? And it's the same thing is it doesn't really matter where you start. I mean, you probably don't want to start with like StyleGAN ADA or, or with GPT-3, but maybe you could start with implementing them and just understanding like how to use them. But honestly, I really don't focus as much on the tools. I focus more on the problems that I'm interested in. And then the tools are a means to an end of me solving that problem. And so I am just trying to look for things maybe on Kaggle that I'm interested in understanding better. The data is there and I say, okay, uh, what, what tools can I use to get from point A to point B? And if it's a visualization or an exploration thing, I say, okay, I can use Plotly, I can use Matplotlib, I can use Altair, I can use Streamlit, I can use a bunch of these different things. And I'm inevitably gonna have a bunch of different visualization problems or exploratory problems that I'm doing if I want to learn something new, I just choose one of those different tools and, and try to implement it. And I've always really learned well from examples. It's not like there aren't thousands of examples of other people using the same tool to build a similar graph, just going in and taking that information and just tweaking it to adjust to your, your specific data set isn't overwhelmingly hard once you've done it a couple of times. So my thought is that, again, rather than focusing on the tools, first focus on the problems, the second thing you should focus on learning is figuring out how the systems work. So the way that a Python module or a Python library is designed is going to be like not that different across a bunch of different Python libraries. There's good programming practices that are hopefully in play. So if you understand how they work, if you understand how just methods work, you can start to just pick these things up more easily. And so the better you get at understanding that system, the more you experiment, the more tools you use, the easier it is to just pick something up relatively quickly out of the box and tinker with it and make it your own and use it. So I think the overwhelming feeling is still going to be there. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of stuff that I don't know. There's a lot of stuff that I haven't prioritized, but I am very confident that if there is something out there that I don't understand at this point in my career, after all the tinkering and experimentation that I've done, I should be able to pick it up at some point. It might not be as easy if it's a really complex concept, but if it's another visualization tool, I could probably pick that up pretty quickly and make it functional for me. I won't be an expert at it. That would take a lot of extra work, 
but I can at least get uh, my, wrap my my mind around it or, or get a feeling for it. So I think that, again, the bottom line is that no one's ever going to know the whole field, but your goal should be to make the things in the field that are going to be useful to solving the problem for you functional as quickly as possible. And that is an attainable skill set. Yeah. So that's awesome. So focusing on the problem, but not on the tools. And so selecting tools that will be able to allow you to gain insights and create values for your stakeholders. Yeah. So that's awesome advice. Um, so I, I guess we already have a pretty good coverage about yourself and perhaps let's move on to a new topic about your career. And so let's start from the example of how do you manage your time for your full-time job and content creation? And what are your time management tips for making both work? Yeah, I think at this point in my life, I, I, I think the biggest thing is I don't believe in work-life balance. I think that there's no there's no state of equilibrium in nature. It's always moving. In some weeks, some months, I might work a lot on content creation in my job. And then another week, another month, I might take it all for my own personal health, for spending time with my family, my friends, whatever that might be. And so this idea that balance is dynamic over a long period of time has helped me be able to work really hard sometimes, spend a lot of hours some weeks, and then realize that I can take a lot of other time off. And I'm very fortunate that my day job as well as content creation are both relatively flexible. I mean, I have to work some each week for the most part, but if I need to take off a significant amount of time and, and squeeze that balloon into another week, I'm able to do that fairly comfortably. In terms of time management, I think that organization and creating systems in my life has been really important. I schedule every single day, almost every hour, and including my breaks, and that allows me to use my time as effectively as I can. I think I've realized that I spend a lot of time doing things that don't add tremendous value to my life. For example, I used to spend a lot of time on Instagram, just scrolling, just sitting there doing nothing. And that time didn't, didn't create a rest period for me. It, it actually was cognitively draining. It didn't feel like that while I was doing it, but afterwards I was still tired. And so I essentially stopped using Instagram. I deleted it from my phone. And so to me, it's like, well, identifying what gives me energy and what doesn't give me energy and what is a waste of my time versus what isn't a waste of my time is, is pretty important. I mean, there's some things like there are shows I watch a lot more seldomly now, but uh, for example, watching YouTube quite a bit, I don't think that's a waste of time because I'm learning things still. And that's something I still try to build, build into my schedule and build into to my, my daily routine. But um, understanding and prioritizing for myself what's more important, what I want to, what time I want to spend where is also very valuable. Uh, the last thing also has to do with scheduling, but I work on my most important thing that day, first thing in the morning when I wake up. That's when I'm most alert. That's when I'm most focused. That's when I'm going to get the most done. And if I'm doing the most important thing of the day each day and I'm cranking it out first, I can usually go to sleep happy that I've at least done the most important thing that I've deemed that day. So awesome. Wow. Yeah. So I guess that's a great way to tackle procrastination. <laughs> and I really like how you mentioned about uh, managing your energy versus managing your time because time is a trivial thing. And as you mentioned that, okay, you might, maybe spend a couple of hours on Instagram, but then you said that it didn't really lead you to more energy. And so you, you figured that, okay, you want to delete that from your life. And so essentially it's like you're managing your energy level versus managing your time. Um, and, and also making that um, work to make you feel more energetic. Um, could you maybe cover that topic a little bit about like energy no. management? Well, that's, that's been a really important one for me. I read a book by, I think it's Cal Newport about digital minimalism. Yeah. Um, and it talks about how over time, over history, we've either been off or on. So we're either actively working on something or we're essentially doing nothing. We're bored and boredom and just being in, you know, walking around in nature, sitting, doing nothing is very important for us to recharge and, and essentially get energy 
Uh, you know, it's a part of a defragmentation process in our brain. And when we're browsing Instagram, while we're doing these passive but active activities, we're still using cognitive resources, even though it doesn't feel like it. And so for me, and for a lot of other people, they can be very, very draining. And so I've tried to think about what activities I do for leisure, and if they are cognitively draining, or if they're not cognitively draining. And so I can go outside and walk, I can go outside and take my camera and shoot some B-roll. Those are all, you know, positive, non-draining uh, energy activities for me. I can sit and meditate. I can read those as long as the reading isn't too technical. Those are things that I can also do that I find recharge me. And so I've been very careful about my leisure and figuring out, hey, what are the activities that I find are positive for downtime versus negative for downtime? And and without it, I, I still browse the internet. I still go on Twitter. I still do whatever it is. Uh, I'm not perfect at this, but just flipping that switch and understanding that there are things that I do that detract from my energy levels that you wouldn't necessarily think would. Like mm -hmm. if you think, oh, I'm lying down, I'm, I'm browsing, you're resting, but in, you're not resting also. Um, so th that's been something that has been pretty monumental in that energy struggle for me is understanding that. And also how you eat, doing exercise every day. Those are things that can, can fill up that tank as well. I, I've, always experimented with how I eat, with doing fasting, with trying different types of diets. And I still don't have anything that's perfect yet, but it's something I tinker with and, and it is also iterative, just like any of the other systems that I talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And so that naturally leads to the next question is, okay, when you're able to manage your energy and your time, how do you avoid burnout? Because like, you know, content creation and your full-time job, uh, they're both demanding. How do you prevent yourself from burning out? So there are definitely times when I do feel burned out. I don't think I have a complete answer to this question, but there, there are really three factors that I find super important. So the first is motivation. And so I have good motivation sometimes, I have bad motivation sometimes. And the biggest thing about motivation is it's unreliable. So. At the very least, there are some things that I can use to push push that motivation lever to, to make me more motivated, but it'll probably go away after a while. You know, I, I think about what I what my big picture goals are and, and those types of things and, and that can get me fired up or think about opportunities that, that I want to create for myself. That can be good, but it's not the end goal. The other thing that I use is accountability. So I have a friend that, that I talk with weekly and we talk about what we're planning to accomplish. And if I don't do it, you know, she's going to rag on me about how I, how I didn't do it. And I said I was going to do it. And I don't want that to happen. I don't want to disappoint my friends. I don't want to uh, limit, you know, I, I don't want to disappoint other people as much as I don't want to, to disappoint myself. And then the last thing is just creating habits right? So habits are automatic. There are things that we do without thinking about it. And so, for example, working on the, the most important thing first thing in the morning for me, that's a habit. I essentially, I, I wake up, I bike for about 10, 15 minutes, I do some stretches, I take a cold shower, I sit down, I work, and then I do whatever else it is. And I've just conditioned myself to get into that mindset. Uh, something that also helps is just having very clear cut goals and and also the goals not being too focused on outcomes. They're exclusively focused on things that you have control over. So rather than thinking about how many YouTube views or something I'm gonna get, I am almost solely focused on how many YouTube videos that I produce and if I'm getting them out on time or if they're, you know, I've, I've added a new feature to each new video. That is so much more rewarding because you're, you can check those boxes every week. You can hit those goals every week if you're putting in the right amount of effort. And obviously it's nice to see growth. It's nice to feel like you're adding value to more people, but those things are not consistent. They're not directly, um, directly temporally related to the individual actions that you have. So I think those things have helped dramatically on the burnout front. Also seeing the fruits of your labor is really good. 
if I ever am feeling burnt, actually the video I'm making in two weeks is about what to do when you get discouraged. So I'm not going to give away all the secret sauce, but um, yeah, just looking back at the body of work you've accumulated and say, wow, this is how far I've come. I should believe in myself a little bit more because I've done cool stuff in the past. Awesome. Yeah. So my take, my takeaway is <clears throat> for one is don't compare yourself to others and pretty much focusing on what you're doing today and how it, how you improved over time. And another, another one would have to be uh, don't focus too much on the performance indicators, just focus on the process, just focus on the process of releasing content video on a consistent basis. Um, because at the end of the day, the, the number of views is not controlled by us, but it's controlled by the viewers. And so we're just making, we're playing our part. And if we're consistent, it's a marathon and over the long haul, we're, we're going to look at it and we're going to be proud of what, how far we have come. Also. Exactly. Right. So we've covered two big topics about yourself and about your career and your advice and time management. Um, perhaps something about content creation. Um, I think we have to start with this question. How did you become a YouTuber? So like most people on YouTube, it happened by accident. I made a, in grad school, I did a project on predicting cryptocurrency prices and I compared LSTM and GRU, um, I forget what they're called, um, gates, they're not gates, they're, um, and their neurons and in, in recurrent neural nets. And um, to me, that was a pretty benign thing. I just put it out there and it was a, a project we had to submit by video. And I didn't realize you could make an unlisted video on YouTube. I just put it up and I came back, you know, a couple months later and it had, I think something like a thousand views. And to me at the time that was astronomical. I mean, we do that in a couple of days now, or even in, in a single day with a video. But at that time I was like, you know, this is, people are interested in this. Wow. What if I could use this as a platform to create value for some other people? So I had had a pretty, you know, I know I said I had an, an easy time getting my first internships after I was in my master's in computer science program, but transitioning from non-technical as a management consultant to a technical role in data science was very difficult without a doubt. There was a lot of times where I had no clue what I was doing, no clue where to start, what the what I had to learn, what that process was like. There, It was just a very big blue deep ocean where I was like, wow where do I start? Where do I go? And I said, I could make videos for Ken two years ago that didn't know any of this. What would I have told myself? What type of advice would I have given? Because I think there's going to be more people that are interested in this path. I mean, it was very clear to me that business and computer science were converging really quickly. And I wanted to be in the middle of that. But how do other people pick up those skills without going into pretty, frankly, aggressive student loan debt like I did. So I was like, well, you know, how do I, how do I get around these things? How do I tell a story that, that again, I would have liked to have, have heard when I was starting this out. And I just started making videos. I made you know, three or four videos, one every month. And then it, I started to get a little more traction and I made a couple more and I made a couple more. And I realized I loved that process. I liked the video making. I liked the storytelling. Obviously, I'm very extroverted. I like talking to people. I like, I, I don't know if I'm vain enough to say I like having seen my face on the screen. I don't think I'm that pretty or anything. But at the same time, it it also helped me to improve my pers interpersonal skills, my ability to talk, my ability to structure a story or an argument. And that's something selfishly I was looking for when I, when I started making more of these videos as well. Awesome. Yeah. So the next question would have to be, how do you come up with topic ideas for your videos? So again, I'll mention that I was really interested in entrepreneurship growing up. Uh, both my parents, they were, they were doctors, not exactly entrepreneurs, but they had their own private practice. And my dad kept telling me, he's like, look at the freedom that I have. I own my own practice. I could take a day off if I want. I could do whatever. And, and that idea of working for yourself was always very, very appealing to me. I didn't want to go down the medicine route. It seems like a lot of school. Granted, I've done almost that much school at this point in my life. So maybe that didn't work out. <laughs> um, on the entrepreneurship front, 
I was always coming up with business ideas. I got in this habit. I, I read in some book, I can't remember what it was, but to write down 10 business ideas every single day, right? When you wake up, that's a habit. It helps you. That's a muscle that you flex that creativity idea. And so I just went in and I started doing that exercise every single morning. And what I found is that the more specific I got. So if, if someone's like, think of 10 business ideas quick, that's pretty hard. But if you're like, hey, think of 10 ways to make an airplane better or like to make an airline flight more appealing and be like, well, going in the seating process is weird. So maybe you have a plane that opens like this and everyone walks in like that probably wouldn't be that cost effective because of the, but, but I mean, it's, it's an idea, right? They didn't have to be good ideas, but I, I was very fortunate that I got into this habit of just that creativity and, and that, that generation of ideas. And when I started making YouTube videos, I thought I was going to run out of ideas. I was like, wow, I have these couple of good ones. They're going to go away. But that same gear kicked on and I find myself just thinking like, wow, that'd be a good YouTube video idea. Let's add that to the list. And I have a list of 50, 70 video ideas. And so the other side of that though, is that if you're making content, you're getting feedback and people will ask for things. And I add those to the list. I mean, it's, it would be idiotic of me as a data scientist and a YouTuber to not take the feedback and listen to what people are interested in. Uh, you could also look at trends and, and see what other people are finding interesting or, or just get inspiration from little things in life every day. And I keep a notebook very close to me almost all the time or my notes on my phone open, or if I get a little inspiration, I channel it and write it down and, and maybe digest it later. So that for me is one of the most fun parts is, you know, what, what is, what can I create that would be a fun story to tell? Um, and then the other side of that is I've started to do a lot more polling, a lot more data collection on my own channel. I still will only make videos that I want to make, but since I have a large enough list, I can do polls to see which, which of the video ideas I have people are most interested in watching. So that's been a really cool evolution evolution for over the last couple of months is that now I'm making videos that people are more excited about, about watching. And that's great for the algorithm. That's great for the growth of the channel. And yeah, you know, it's great for me too, is that I was going through a little bit of a slump for a while. And um, I, I'm really happy that I can start making stuff that people are resonating with uh, through again, who would have thought this data collection process. Right. Yeah. So speaking on YouTube growth, could you maybe cover this topic of how did you, how did you blow up your channel? Um, there was a point in time when I, I also first created my channel and I was pretty much benchmarking with other channels in, in the field and getting inspired from many of the content. And one of the channel was yours. And then I noticed that there was this video, how I would learn data science if I have to start over. And so that video went viral. And then afterwards you were featured on the, you, you was a creator on the rise. And then your, your channel blew up even more. And then could you maybe talk about this journey on your, your growth hacking of your channel? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I hate to say it, a large portion of that is attributed to luck. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I have no clue what I did in that video that made it blow up so much more than my other stuff. Obviously, I've tried to re recreate that type of success with without, yeah, I've never had another one that had that much that growth potential, et cetera. Um, but the thing that was different about that video is I made a very similar video before that was my highest performing video. So I made a video about how I learned data science and that just told my story of the process I went through. And then I used the exact same thumbnail effectively, changed some wording and made one about how I would learn data science. And that was really compelling to a lot of people, obviously very compelling, probably more so to the algorithm. And uh, things just really took off from there. I mean, it opened up a lot of doors in terms of collaboration. I think that something that I've been really proud of was the, the number of different people that I've met through this, who I've either had on my podcast or collaborated with on YouTube. That's something that I think is really great for any type of growth. Uh, I've also been lucky to be on a couple of those lists where it's like data science youth producers to follow. That's in my mind, the most genius viral marketing move ever. Like if you want to have a successful, if you want to get eyeballs on a product or something, just make a top list of YouTubers or content creators and they're all going to share it. So it just gets 
sent everywhere and no one ever pays attention until it's too late to what the product is or any of these things are. So I think that's a something that has served me well is that I've, I've been fortunate to be on a couple of those. And I, I also really like meeting content creators in the space, whether they're a lot bigger than I am, or I'm a lot bigger than they are. You know, I think that as long as they're taking it seriously and, and, you know, there's, it's not a, a weird interaction or anything. It doesn't feel like they're asking for something from me. I, I really like to help out because one, I see, I, I've lived through that experience of trying to grow a YouTube channel. I had a lot of questions just like in data science, right? And I, I still have a lot of questions and I wish I had, uh, you know, half as many resources as I have now uh, to ask people about those things. But it's also, you know, building a good data science community is something I'm a huge proponent of. It's something I talk about. If I wasn't in line, if I, if I wasn't, actively trying to do that, it wouldn't be in line with a lot of the things I say on my channel. And so I really want to foster not just as beginner data scientists, but data science YouTubers, like it should be a happy place to, to share our information. It, it's not like we're competing against each other. It's not how YouTube really works. Just because someone watches my video actually makes it probably more likely that they're going to watch one of your videos too. So my thought is there is like, if I spread goodwill, if I'm excited about those things, I mean, any data science YouTuber could blow up and become much bigger than I am essentially overnight. If I've collaborated with them, if I've created goodwill there, if I've treated other people well, there's no way that hurts me in the longer term, right? If I'm nasty to people or I ignore them or whatever it is, like that probably won't go over well for me, especially if this person becomes bigger. So I'm just trying to, you know, there, there's two sides to it, right? One, I just right. want to, like, I want to be a good guy. I want to, share the experience and give my advice. And two, it's look like if I do that, there could be potential, uh, you know, positive outcomes. I'm not going to ask them to do anything for me. That's not who I am. But if you're good to someone and, you know, there's some of that, that gratitude there, like they're going to want to share your stuff. They're going to want to do more stuff with you. They're going to want to, people don't forget those types of things. And you right. know, there are people early in my YouTube stuff that were nice to me and, you know, I'll, I'll do, you know, you're one of them. I, I'll do anything for you guys. So uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, that's just maybe like a little life lesson that I've learned is if you treat everyone well, or you try to do your best by them, you're not going to measure how it comes back to you, but it almost always comes full circle. Awesome. Yeah. It's like karma, right? What goes around exactly. comes around. You're providing yeah. value and maybe one day in the future, I mean, good thing will come back to you. Yeah. And I, yeah. By, I'm by no means perfect. I'm sure I've done something bad to someone at some point in time, or I, I ignore a lot of emails because I just frankly don't have time to answer all of them, but I do my best, right? <laughs> That's right, all we can right, do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, particularly when your inbox is flooding with a couple thousand emails. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. And yeah, speaking of bringing value to the community, um, I think you're you're one of the major player in the YouTube front to bring together content creators and data science. Um, particularly, you created this Discord, and then you brought together all of the YouTubers doing content in data science, like Daniel Bork, Josh Starmer, Andrew Mo, uh, Tina Huang, and, and there's several others. And and recently, there is also Luke Luke Barus, who's a data analyst, and and also Alex, the analyst. And so I think you're, you're like a, like a pioneer in this front, you know, like bringing, assembling, you know, like this massive team of like-minded individuals. And it, you know, like the, the crazy thing is, it's like we instant, we instantly could connect with one another. It's like we, we have, we share this common interest and although we have never met one another in, in person, but you know, like anyone who's a content creator in data science, it's like we, we've known them for quite some time. And yeah, it's, it's like we connect with, with one another. Um, could you maybe share about this? As well? Yeah, well, I, I think there's something really beautiful about the internet that I found over time is that, you know, let's say, let's say I walk into a bar down the street. What are the odds that someone in there is going to be in, interested in data science to begin with? I mean, maybe one out of a hundred people in there. What are the odds that they're also going to be a content creator? One in a million, maybe. And so, the internet or 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 groups, you can self-select 
who you want to talk to. And it's very easy to find people who are interested in the same things as you are. And so that is something to me that's so powerful is that you can join communities of like-minded people that historically you, maybe you could only find at a university or in these very small places, but now they're relatively easy to find. You talk about like 66 days of data, uh, that's a community for data science beginners. We can go meet other people. You can learn from other people. You can get accountability partners. You can start a project together. It's, it's all there, right? And that's something that I never really appreciated the, the power of before. And over the course of the content creation journey, over the course of even this pandemic, I realized how incredible that is. I've, I've met, in my mind, lifelong friends from this space and it's so much easier to become a lifelong friend if you have all of this stuff in common that we could self-select on the internet for, right? I mean, right. the odds of me finding someone that has so much in common with me, even as yourself, in in the real world, just by going around doing whatever I do without having the internet would be really low, you know? And to me, that's that's like the power of, of technology, the power of, of all of this stuff. You look at dating too, right? I mean, the fact that there are these dating apps where one, they're using machine learning to match compatible people to the, the volume of people that you can meet on an app that might be compatible with you is so much higher. I think that that landscape is completely revolutionized. And in the same way, just making friends is completely revolutionized. It's, mm-hmm. It blows my mind. And, and it, it puts me in awe every day is that over the content creation journey, I probably I did okay with friends, you know, I, I'm extroverted. I like to get out there, but I probably made more very meaningful friendships over this journey than I have in my whole life. And that, that is something that I encourage everyone to do. I mean, the internet's a, gr- a great place. It can be a little scary sometimes, but um, use it to the, to the best of its ability. I mean, there are people out there like you there, the world is a very big place um, and it's easier to find them now than ever. Okay. And bring them and together, so, right? They're going to appreciate that. Right, exactly. Yeah, so this led naturally to the next question, which you briefly mentioned, is the 66 Days of Data Initiative. Could you maybe tell us, like, what inspired you to create this initiative? So I I was feeling a little stagnant with my own learning. I was just a little bored. I wasn't super motivated. And I wanted to snap out of it. And so I just read the book called... Atomic Habits by James Clear. James Clear. And in it, he says that the average amount of time that it takes for you to learn a new habit, to ingrain a new habit is around 66 days. And obviously there's problems with averages, but 66 in my mind just stuck. It, it was a good sounding number. And I said, hey, you know, I'm going to learn data science every day for 66 days. I'm going to tweet about it. I'm going to have other people hold me accountable. I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to get in this habit of sharing and other people can do this with me. And so the idea there is that essentially for 66 days, you study data science every day. The minimum threshold is five minutes. So if you don't have time, like everyone should be able to fit in five minutes of their day. You can watch a data professor YouTube video. You can watch a stat quest video. You can watch one of my videos that would count. Um, and then the accountability part to me is really important is that's one of the levers that, that I can pull is that if my motivation isn't there, we're creating that habit. We're also layering in that accountability aspect. And if I have people on the internet telling me to do it, oh, there we go, we're back. Um, and if I have people on the internet telling me to do it, then, or I'm telling people on the internet that I'm, that I'm doing it, there's a lot of people to, to hold me accountable on that front. Um, the last thing that I've always encouraged is sharing your work. Uh, it, it, create, it, it pays tremendous dividends. It allows you to get feedback. It allows you to also just put yourself out there and create opportunities for yourself. If you think about it, making a post compounds while you sleep. It's out there working for you, spreading awareness, doing branding for you when you're, you're just in bed, when you're not doing anything. And to me, that's like this crazy concept that I'd love to share with more people. And so you get all these great benefits from from doing that. And I wanted to do it. I said that if this is an initiative I'm going to create, I'm going to be the first one to do it. People can join me as a cohort. I actually wasn't the first one to do it. I think someone started, before, a couple of people started before me, even when I announced it. And I was like, well, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the general premise is I wanted to make myself better. I wanted to establish these specific things, this system in my life. And people liked it. It gained a good amount of traction and 
it's continuing to grow. People are doing starting it every day. And right. uh, I've been talking with some sponsors to do a bunch of giveaways and, and you know, to reward people for, for integrating with this challenge. Right. So it's like, yeah, it's like we call it, you're, you're sharing your journey with other people. You're being accountable because you're saying it to the world that you're going to do it. And so you, you're probably going to disappoint others if you're not doing it. And I think it's, it, it also builds pretty good habit for you if you're doing it on a consistent basis. And as, as you mentioned in the book, 66 days is a number to gain a new habit. And yeah, th there's another video on YouTube talking about like, you have to do something for 10,000 hours in order to be become like a master of, of a topic. And so apparently you only need 66 days in order to have a good habit in order to do that. And so, yeah, that, that's some very uh, cool stuff. Um, for now, I think another interesting question that a lot of people would like to know is what's your plan for 2022 and beyond for your YouTube channel and your Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I want to keep doing what I'm doing. I, I love making videos. I probably want to get a little bit more creative. I'd love to do some more projects. Something this year that I, I, I wanted to do more of is just building things and, and putting them out into the world. We started to do that with a leaderboard project, but I mean, three people working on it part-time isn't often enough to, to make as much traction as we hope. So, I mean, that's something I really want to continue to push. Uh, I also, I, I want to make the podcast as good as I can and start really bringing, continuing to bring in awesome guests. Uh, last, I want to do a, probably a little more course content as well. I'm currently teaching a course at DePaul University for grad students called Designing Ethical AI Systems. And I really do enjoy teaching in a more formal way. And I think that if I have the opportunity to make another online course or do something down the, that line, I would really like to capitalize on it. I have to find time. I mean, I'm, again, I'm, my, my work is picking up. I'm doing that full time as well as the content. So I think for me, it's just sticking to producing content and hopefully making it valuable and getting feedback and iterating on it. Uh, I think I would be foolish to try to do anything too crazy or too big or too outside of that box in the short term. I definitely have plans to do some of that crazy stuff in the longer term, but uh, you know, I, the way I look at it is I'm still uh, a relatively in terms of all of YouTube, like a relatively small YouTuber. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to establish a brand. And uh, I, I hope that in the next you know, two or three years, I reached that critical mass where I can keep this going with really good systems and I can start branching out and making other things that I'm really passionate about as well. Right. Awesome. So now that we've learned about, about yourself, about your career, about your content creation journey, um, probably the next one would be to talk about some of the questions that we have from the subscribers on uh, YouTube and also from Twitter. Um, one of the first question is, why do you have a passion for what you've specialized in and when that passion propel you to teach other? And this was asked by millennial mom life on Twitter. Also, I think I answered that a little bit in my conversation about how I got into data science, where I just had this passion for golf and it, mm -hmm. I just always wanted to understand how the best people performed and how I could improve my own game. I just love the game. I've, I've always loved it. And it always bothered me so much that I couldn't compete at a higher level. And I just wanted to understand that. I wanted to understand why I wasn't physically able to do that. And if you can't do something, if you're tenacious enough, it just drives you mad until you try to dissect it in every different way. And that for me was something that, that was just a huge motivating factor. I also think that I wanted to teach because I like to teach. I, I you know, hearing someone talk about how they landed a job and how my, my content was helpful in that process. I, I will never say that it was me that, that landed someone a job, right? Like it is someone else's hard work that goes into landing a job. Maybe I have a part in, in playing in that, but that brings me so much more joy and so much more excitement than like any of the financial side of the content creation that I've done. It makes me so much happier to hear that like someone either learned something from my videos or that it's been instrumental in, in their process than seeing like an ad revenue check. It just, for some reason, 
and there's nothing wrong with with appreciating money and those type of thing. I'm definitely not complaining about income that I make, but I've just always been so much more drawn to that human element. And maybe it's because I'm an only child. I didn't have that much, uh, <laughs> you know, as much like a peer to peer interaction or something growing up. But I just love that. And and it, that's why I still respond to almost every comment that I have is that, you know, they're willing to take the time to watch my videos, especially if it's a nice one, a, a nice comment. Like, I want to engage with that. I love that. I, I, I that's that brings me a lot of joy and happiness to, to see people getting that value out of my stuff. So I'm obviously pretty passionate about <laughs> about that process. And um, I, I know how hard it is to, to learn something. And if I feel like I could help in that process, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And another question from the subscriber is what is sports analytics and how can one break into sports analytics and what model do you frequently use for analyzing sports data? And they're asked from Saeed Alaudin Bukhari and also Angel Esteban from Twitter. Yeah, so sports analytics is essentially just applying data science to the sports domain. So a, a very basic evaluation of sports analytics is looking at how many goals someone scores per minute or per per game or whatever that might or, or per you know 30 minutes played or whatever it is during soccer or i guess non-american football um or looking at a batting average in baseball like how often they get on base as well and it can get a lot more advanced than that we look at statistics like wins above replacement or in golf strokes gained or in, or in basketball win share but essentially we're trying to make sense of what people are doing when they're on the court they're on the pitch they're on the course whatever it might be and if it depends what we want to do we can either try to improve their performance like the work that i'm doing by changing their decision making or training how they changing how they train or we can try to predict their performance which is what you'd want to do if you were playing fantasy sports who are betting on the outcomes. Uh, there's another way that you can, that you can be a part of this field and that's through media. So if you're creating visuals to help people understand or appreciate the game more, or, or to help uh, improve their experience while watching the, the sports, that's the last way. And you can do all of this with data. So that's my thoughts on essentially what the field is. I have a video where I talk about exactly what it is and how to break in as well. But if you want to do sports analytics, there's no one model that you do. Usually at a most basic level, you want to predict how many points someone's going to score, right? That's a, that's a very straightforward or semi-straightforward question you'll, you'd likely ask. And the basic starting point is with a linear regression. That helps you to understand what factors are important in in scoring points. So if someone essentially takes a lot of shots on goal, probably going to score more points, right? It's highly correlated. Same thing with football is if you have a running back, how many touches they get per game, uh, that means how many times they get the ball essentially is really highly correlated with how many fantasy points or something that they score. So, you know, you can be pretty basic like that, or it can get significantly more sophisticated. So I would start easy. I'd start reading blogs like 538, uh, nylon calculus if you like basketball watching some of my videos where i've done some of these types in the past um, and start thinking about the questions you'd like to answer about sports or about scenarios within sports and then what data could be used to to come to the solutions awesome and another one was was what model do you frequently use for analyzing your sports data so we use random forest a lot we do a bunch of simulation we don't really do much deep learning on it because the volume of data just in my mind isn't large enough to be practical. The right. ex explicability using a random forest like you alluded to in our other interview is pretty good. So I generally enjoy that methodology. That's essentially the first model I almost always use for everything because you don't have to worry as much about multicollinearity or, or the necessarily if the, the data is normally distributed. So it's a nice, you obviously iterate on it and you have to look at some of these other things for these other tests. But to me, that's like a, hey, good baseline. We can adjust based on that. Awesome. Yeah. And another general question is, what domain do you think have the most opportunities for data science? And how can one acquire a specific domain knowledge? Domain is interesting. So I feel like there's something big that I'm missing that I can't think of. I know fintech is going to have a lot of data science opportunity. Health 
is going to have a lot um, uh, like even real estate, something that's a bit antiquated now. I think companies like BlackRock or, or big real estate holding companies are really warming up to the data science, data analytics. I think people are always thinking about the cutting edge, like what's the next tech platform going to be? But it's these companies that are in industries that are, are slow to change are going to be the ones that have the most job opportunities in the next couple of years. I mean, think about finance. I, I have a guy coming on the podcast in, in a couple of weeks here, and he's talking about how not necessarily hedge funds, but institutional investors or investment firms, mutual funds, they're actually very behind on the analytics front. And inevitably, they're going to start using analytics more, but that process is going to lag over time. So as certain industries become more accepting of analytics, that opens up jobs. It's not like it's completely saturated now. It's that, well, the jobs are going to open up when the, the culture associated with a lot of these industries slowly starts to change. So I think it's a different way to, to look at it is like not all data science is done on the complete cutting edge, the highest level of technology. It's not all what they're doing at Google. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really valuable at these companies that are just starting to use data effectively now. So how would you go get that subject area domain? I would say projects, or you just take that subject area domain from something you did before. Uh, for example, I was a, I'm trying to think, uh, obviously my golf domain, I did a lot of projects. I was really interested in that, but I've heard of people who are, uh, they studied agriculture in undergrad and they take those agriculture skills and they start applying data to it and they become really valuable to agriculture organizations because they have good agriculture skills. And then they also have some of these data skills, which are pretty, pretty valuable. And, you know, they're indexing more on their agriculture skills to begin with, but you're going to take a chance on a data analyst that has the exact agriculture skills you need and, and assume they're going to be able to learn more data uh, literacy than the other way around and trying to teach someone the entire domain of agriculture. So you can get into data, data science, data analytics, if you just have very, very strong subject area expertise and some data knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks for some solid advice. Um, and another related question is, what is the future of data science after 15 years? And this was asked from Ang Suman Das from YouTube. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing in like two weeks from now. So it's probably not the, not the I, I think 15 years is just way too far out to, to understand a problem. I, I can say that in five years, you know, we're probably going to be the, the amount of compute power is going to continue to grow. And maybe not uh, like number of, was it transistors per microchip, like what Moore's law is based off of, but the power of cloud computing and cluster computing, I think is going to improve. We haven't seen that much advancements in ML algorithms per se. I mean, if you're looking at neural nets, what has changed is the, the compute power, not necessarily the framework we're using. Like, yes, we have convolutional neural nets and capsule neural nets now, but the improvement of those technologies is pretty marginal of the algorithms is pretty marginal compared to the compute uh, growth. I think that at a high level, data science will become either, will will split into two directions. So it'll become more focused on either engineering or explicability. So right now, data scientists kind of do both of those things. I think you'll probably see more specific roles defined more clearly within data science, or I'm hoping that you would. And, you know, one of those roles, I think, is going to be very focused on implementation, like a machine learning engineer. And one is probably going to be more close to an internal business consultant that's explaining what the data, what the machine learning engineers are doing and the data engineers are doing. So uh, that would be my thought. I I would read the book. It's called AI Superpowers by, I forget the guy's name. Kai Fooling? Yeah, yeah. Kai Fooling. Uh, Kai Fooling, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that's a really good perspective of what the future of AI and this technology looks like. I think he's a bit, a bit ambitious with the advancements and the amount that he believes jobs will be taken over and stuff like that. I mean, he works in a VC, he's worked in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley moves a lot faster than the rest of the world. Like, like we're going to have a lot of these companies that are just starting to use data science in the next five years. And there's going to be a need for data scientists in those roles still. He's probably right about the very, very high end of, of super tech forward thinking companies, but that isn't representative of all companies in the US or, or around the world even. So 
Um, that would be a book, a really great book. And, and it does give some incredible perspective on how the US and China view AI differently. But uh, that, that would be a starting place. He, he's probably more knowledgeable in that area than I am. Awesome. All right. So now we have pretty much covered all of the technical topics. And let's move on to the fun stuff. So I, I think that all of us would like to know, you know, like from many of your past videos, you have integrated papayas into it in creative ways. Could you tell us what is your story with papayas and why, why, why do you like it so much that you're integrating it into YouTube? So I'm not going to give you a perfect answer, but I can allude to it. So something I think that is, is really important and something that I really love about what a lot of other YouTubers have done is they've created sort of a subculture. They've created a storyline. They've created a, a gimmick or an inside joke within their community. And with the papayas, with dinosaurs, with little other things that I do that you might not notice, I'm trying to create a little bit of this subculture and this backstory and to me, the papaya is fun. I live in Hawaii. I have access to them. I enjoy them. My dad really likes papayas. I, I won't, I won't, I secretly won't tell the origin, but okay. I, I think that it makes the content more fun if it's a little lighter. And if someone watches three or four videos and they see it, they're going to wonder about it. And it's, and right. it's, and it's going to make them have these other questions and want to get more engaged or want to know the backstory. So to me, I love the idea of storytelling. I love the idea of themes. I like the idea of continuity and, and being able to time all of my content together. Mm. And that's one way I can have a lot of fun with it and, cool. and eat a lot of delicious papayas. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, like, like in Thailand, we have a lot of papaya as well. And there's also this uh, fruit uh, called durian. Yeah, uh, the, really the, durian. The spiky one. Yeah. 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 I actually like durian, so... Is durian the one with the, the very strong smell or is that? Yes, exactly. That's a, yeah. Okay. yeah, very strong. Yeah. But it, it also tastes like cake if, if you get the good ones. Yeah, yeah. I, I like durian quite a bit. Um, yeah, we used to, so I used to grow, we grew up eating, there was this one restaurant and they'd make this Chinese dish. It's just like tofu that smelled really bad. It was okay. like super fermented. And my dad loved it and I, I would eat it, uh, you know, but the smell was just so bad. We'd go and the whole, like, they'd have to put us in this back room okay. because it would clear out the whole restaurant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh so the, the smell of food I'm, I'm used to, but it just cracks me up, reminds me of that. Cool. And you, you know, like what was the crazy thing is that machine learning has also been used for telling the difference between a good and bad durian. Uh, I think I remember putting in one of the comments to your post about durian. Um, like, like they have this application where they train the model. And then if you take a, a wooden stick, you hit on the durian. And if it makes a particular sound signal, it'll, it'll tell you, okay, this is a good tasting durian. This is ripe. This is good enough. And so you could take along this app and, and select a good durian. Uh, because awesome. normally it's very difficult to select one. They would have to take a, a wooden stick and hit on the durian, hit on it, and then it'll make this like you know like the wooden sound. It's like hitting on a drum, and it, based on the sound, you could tell whether it's good or bad. Yeah, so that's not another Sick. crazy thing for machine learning. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, I want to uh, now. I want to build one to see if uh, papayas are ripe or not. That one's pretty easy though. <laughs> they just turn yellow. Uh, at least for the the Hawaii gold papaya. There's a lot uh, of different types of papaya. So right. I, I, I actually only like the Hawaii gold papaya. I don't mm -hmm. like the Mexican red papaya very much. It tastes kind of funky to me. Mm -hmm. But for anyone that's a papaya doubter, you have to try the Hawaii gold. Very, All very right. good. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Ken, for being awesome. on the podcast. And it's my big pleasure. And... I can say that you're one of my best friends on YouTube and also in real life as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, such, a, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be your friend. I, I'm just very happy that through YouTube, I was able to, to meet you. I was able to, to create content with you. I was able to, yeah, just, you know, we were able to both get to where we are now. And it's looking back, it's been so much fun. And I'm just happy that we got to continue doing this, you know, and, and there'll be more to come for sure. Yeah, definitely. 
And so I hope that you found this video helpful. And please don't forget to head over to Ken's channel and subscribe to his YouTube channel. And don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, hit on the notification bell so that you will be notified of the next video. And as always, the best way to learn data science is to do data science. And please enjoy the journey.